And I just came up with a great idea I tried to sell him was to go to the college president here when he graduates up there with his doctorate and we want to come down here and set up a doctoral program for the Central Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I am a scholar of the American Revolution in the South, but not specifically um, a Marian scholar. And there are probably many people in this room um, who know as much or more than I do about the facts. But um, I'd like to talk to you about this a little bit differently uh, because the work that I do has to do with stories and with the way people tell stories um, and with the way people remember the past. And so this is really important um, when we're looking at Marion. Uh, it's funny because my, my good friend Dave Nealon uh, gave a talk yesterday um, that we were both sort of concerned um, earlier on, our, our, we were gonna step on each other's toes and had to, to exchange some emails to, to sort that out. Um, but Dave asked you guys to think about Marion and specifically the conversation between Weems and O'Ree um, as being a question of fact and fiction. Um, on the one hand, the historical, uh, factual Marion, the person who actually lived, uh, as, as championed by his friend Ori, and on the other hand, this kind of invented romantic figure uh, who was created by Weems, and, and it, which is, is more of a, a fictional interpretation. Uh, and I think that's a really useful way of thinking about the problem. Uh, but there's, there's another important aspect of that dichotomy, and so I wanna help you guys kind of step away um, from thinking about this as fact versus fiction, and to also think of that sort of middle ground uh, that we call mythology. And uh, the ways that mythology is uh, equally important to historical fact when we're thinking about the past. And so I want to propose to you sort of a radical uh, proposition. And that is, there was this man, Francis Marion. He existed in the physical world. He did, he did the things that he did. He died in 1795. There is this other person, the Swamp Fox, who has lived for the last 200 years. Both of them are equally real. Both of them are equally important to understanding um, the history of the United States and the world that we live in today. They are not the same person, uh, but they are both very real. And hopefully by the time I'm done, um, you'll understand what I mean by that. Um, Benedict Anderson is a historian of nationality and of identity, um, and he says that there's a formal universality of nationality um, in the modern world, and that everyone can, should, and will have a nationality as he or she has a gender. Um, and you could also say as he or she has a race, has um, uh, any other characteristic that you think of as being inherent to who you are as a person. Uh, that, that sense of nationality is an equally important per part of a person's identity. But that nationality doesn't come from, from nowhere, right? The United States was created during the American Revolution as a political entity, but it was also created as an idea, as a concept, um, and especially as uh, an identity. And one really important way of doing that is through the construction of mythology. Uh, and I want to be careful when I talk about mythology because we often use the word mythology synonymously with fiction, and that's not the way I mean it. Uh, for me, it's not important whether a myth is true or not. That's not what makes it a myth. What makes a myth important is what its place is in, um, in telling us about ourselves and in telling other people about us. There's a lot of really interesting scholarship that's gone on recently, um, especially in the field of anthropology, where people have looked at the myths of certain cultures and asked those questions 
um, about, about what the myths we tell say about us. Um, we can look at people like, like Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung who talk about mythical archetypes and the characters who appear in a culture's myth and how um, those characters both reflect that culture and at the same time in, in a cyclical way go on to create that culture. Um, and so I want to ask the question, what do our myths say about us? Um, and specifically, this myth, this myth of uh, the swamp fox that you know, both Dave Nealon and um, Christine Swagger have helped us to see, you know, there's this kind of, there, there's this, there's something there that's not just a straight telling of the history. Um, there's a lot in that story that does something different. Um, and I don't normally like to read, and I, I promise I won't read for this whole presentation, but I do want to read uh, one little section that I wrote out because I wanted to make sure that I got the wording exactly right. So this will be the only part of my presentation I read. Uh, but it seems to me that there are three different ways in which mythology is created. First, there's what I want to call interventions of fact. So in this case, these are stories that are entirely fictional or at a minimum so apocryphal that um, they're in their documentation that they are essentially fictional. So in terms of the American Revolution, I would put things in this category like uh, the story of Betsy Ross or George Washington and the Cherry Tree from Weems. Um, these things, their relation to factual events uh, is pretty demonstrably weak, and uh, these are the easiest interventions for historians to identify. And um, because they're not bound by the confines of reality, uh, these actually tend to often be the most, the most um, transparent, the least subtle expressions of nationalist ideas. Then we have the second category, which are a little more subtle, which are um, what I would call uh, interventions of meaning, where we take events that are ambiguous, they happened, um, but they don't necessarily have inherent meaning, and we assign meaning to them. And so here, and I know I'm on kind of shaky ground talking about this here, but um, I would suggest our, our interpretation of Bannister Tarleton. Uh, this is an intervention of meaning, right? He existed, he did a lot of things. You can construe those things to mean um, that he was this ruthless, bloodthirsty killer, uh, on the other hand, if you are a revisionist historian, like my good friend Jim Pikich, you can, um, you can understand those exact same events completely differently. Um, so these are interventions of meaning. Um, and they, these things are made possible by the very fact that history is so subjective and uh, malleable and it depends on where you stand. Um, and yet, ironically, uh, they often establish their own primacy by denying subjectivity, right? These are the things that they become important because they themselves deny that, that very sense of subjectivity, of standing on the outside um, and seeing things from a, so, something from a certain perspective. Then finally, the most subtle interventions that we make in, in our history um, are what I would call interventions of emphasis. And these are sometimes the most powerful of all. And these are things where the event clearly happened. Um, there's nothing really ambiguous or all that ambiguous about what it is, what it means, but we can choose to either make this a central part of the story or we can relegate it to the sidelines. And those choices are always being made in history. We have an infinite number of events to choose from. We have a finite time to tell a story. Uh, and so we're, we're constantly making those choices of what's important and what's, in not, what's not in telling our story. Um, and this is the most subtle way that we influence our identity by the way we tell um, stories like the American Revolution. But in many ways, it's also the most powerful. Uh, and so in this category, I would put things like Washington crossing the Delaware or the winter at Valley Forge, which, you know, there's nothing overly controversial about those stories. Um, there's not really any major interventions of fact or interventions of meaning, but the fact that we've chosen those events out of all the events of the American Revolution 
and chosen to give them such a central location in our story also says a lot about what we find important in that story. Um, the American Revolution is not just a myth for, um, for the United States and for the American people. In many ways, it's the central myth um, because it's the creation myth. And uh, you'll hear this brought up a lot. And again, you know, I, I want to emphasize that that doesn't mean it, it didn't happen, right? Um, I, that's not the way I'm using the word myth. So please don't leave and, and tell your friends that I said the American Revolution never happened. Um, but but uh, within, within our story of ourselves, within our history, um, and within the way that, that all cultures tell stories about themselves, the creation myth always has a central location. And so the way we tell this story and what it means has a lot of power in the present. Um, and I, I would urge you to look no further than uh, the political discourse in this country right now, where both the far left and the far right um, are using the rhetoric of the American Revolution and appealing to the founders and um, you know, coming back to that question of, what would the founders say? What, you know, what would the founders do? Were they in this position? And of course, answering the question completely differently. Um, but, but that's sort of the point, that, that the myth itself has power. And despite the fact that it's subjective, because it's our creation story, it has a lot of, uh, a lot of that meaning. So I'd originally talk, intended to talk a lot about Weems, because Weems is central to this story. But Dave has already covered that, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of um, give you the abbreviated version. Uh, but for the Marian part of the story, Weems, Sims, and James are all, are the, the three, you know, foundational characters in creating the story of the Swamp Fox, that guy that, that is born after Francis Marion dies, um, and creating him as an important piece of uh, the, American, the American mythology. But um, they're often criticized by historians for not sticking to that kind of factual, that factual basis, um, the factual core and, and that kind of objective truth. But it's important to remember that um, they didn't see themselves as historians in the same way that we currently think of history, that kind of rigorous factual, almost scientific study of the past uh, is really a very 20th century thing. And so when Weems talks about himself being a historian, he doesn't see himself as doing that. He sees himself doing equally important work, which is using the past and stories about the past to help create these moral lessons for um, American people and to help give them a connection to their past that makes them better citizens in the world. And uh, here, Weems' own words serve to make this point better than I ever could. He says, um, he writes in the introduction to his biography of Washington, when he's writing about communicating stories of virtue, that of all the means tending to accomplish this end, this best of ends, meaning um, communicating virtue to our children, there is none like setting before readers the bright examples of persons eminent for their virtues. Um, so the example of another human being who exemplifies those values, and specifically those values of citizenship that uh, the new American Republic needed to establish, uh, that, he saw that as his primary goal, not any kind of loyalty to uh, a factual objective past. For him, History is about cultural transmission. It's about passing on this idea of what it means to be an American to, uh, to our children. But the thing about being an early American that we often fail to realize is that we, living it in the 21st century, have this rich American history on which to draw. And they didn't have that. As a new nation, they didn't have that kind of cultural historical identity. It wasn't there. They had to create it. Um, and they were aware of this. People like William Sims, James, um, Washington Irving, who I'll talk about in a minute, they were all 
in this space of, of consciously recognizing that they had to do this work of creating a cultural identity. Because all of the cultural identity that they had, and all the past, and all the history that they had to draw on, was British. And part of creating the United States, not just as a political entity, but as an idea, meant creating our own history and our own past that uh, we can draw on. Now much of that initially, in the years right after the revolution, had to do with martyrs. This is a, a common trope that would have been recognizable in European history, in classical history, to anyone who is thinking about this idea of national role models and national history, national identity. Uh, the, the role model, the, the trope of the martyr, and you see this again and again in those very earliest uh, stories of the American Revolution, the emphasis on martyrs. Um, Richard Montgomery, uh, Joseph Warren, Hugh Mercer, even Isaac Hain, uh, and Nathan Hale. These are the kinds of people who exemplify those American virtues, um, the people who are willing to die for them. But the thing about martyrs is that most cultures have martyr stories. That doesn't tell us what it means to be an American, right? That there is obviously um, an importance to the martyrdom story, but the British had martyr stories. And the United States, as a young adolescent nation in the late 18th and early 19th century, like all adolescents, what they needed was a way to distinguish themselves from their parents, uh, to set themselves apart. And so what did it mean to be an American, and what kind of myths helped to define us as Americans? So in the early part of the 19th century, we start to answer that question. And you start to see this uniquely American kind of hero coming out in initially American literature, uh, fiction. And especially I want to call your attention to people like James Fenimore Cooper, who um, writes a series of novels about the frontier, the most famous of which is Last of the Mohicans, um, which you've probably read or seen the film. And this is one of the earliest, most salient examples of this American hero um, who is unique and, and substantially different from the British hero or the European hero in a couple of important ways. First, the emphasis on freedom, which is a very American value. Um, second, the emphasis on practicality, and especially cleverness. These American heroes, in a way that heroes from other cultures really don't, um, they really exemplify almost being, um, almost being conniving, but in a good way, right? They're, they're practical, they're clever, they're always scheming, um, trying to figure out how to, to accomplish something in an unconventional way. Um, and yet, at the same time, they're always very principled. So this, these two things are kind of held hand in hand. Clever, um, wily, but at the same time, principled. And using that cleverness uh, to, to achieve more moralistic ends. And they always find a way to stay alive or to accomplish the goal that they have in mind without compromising those essential American virtues. And the final thing, which is very uniquely American, and you start to see developing in this 19th century, uh, this 19th century literature, is the idea of being contemptuous of authority. In all of these, these earlier European versions of this story, um, these hero stories, authority is something to be respected. And in fact, reverence for authority is celebrated. But as American mythology starts to develop, um, you, you actually see the opposite, that this kind of contempt for authority uh, and being driven by one's own moral compass and own principles becomes something to be celebrated. All of this comes into uh, the, the trappings of the citizen soldier, which is both a part of the reality of the history of the American Revolution and how much American, uh, the American army relied on the militia, but it's also part of the mythology of the American Revolution and the things about that story that we emphasize later. The idea of the citizen soldier. Uh, think about the society of the Cincinnatus, which appeals to another myth, uh, 
from another culture and compares the American soldier to Cincinnatus who, you know, goes to serve his country in its time of need, but can't wait to get home. He's not a career soldier. He's not a professional. He is um, the farmer who beats his plowshare into a sword and then back into plowshare. Um, and this becomes the name for the society of Washington's officers after the war. It's um, a, a myth that they are constantly appealing to. I also want to talk about how this kind of parallels one myth that did exist in British mythology, um, and that's the story of Robin Hood. And Marion gets compared to Robin Hood a lot, both in those early 19th century stories and then also later, as we'll see. Um, but, but Robin Hood is that kind of um, free, practical, clever, but principled, con contemptuous, contemptuous of authority kind of figure who um, is actually kind of a minor player in British mythology, and yet we borrow that figure and we elevate him. I mean, Robin Hood is a bigger deal in the United States than in Britain. And at the same time, we start modeling our own mythological heroes after that mold. So, we have Fenimore Cooper creating these, these frontier stories, and the frontier becomes an important location for these people. Um, we also have Washington Irving, who starts out in writing fiction, and then migrates into what he would call history. Uh, but just like Weems, he sees the boundaries as being kind of fuzzy. So he writes these classic American works of fiction, like um, obviously Rip Van Winkle, Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and then he goes on to write his own biography of George Washington, um, biography of Ben Franklin. He writes about uh, Christopher Columbus, and if you ever learned in school that um, when Columbus sailed west, he was the only person that knew the earth was round, and everybody else thought it was flat, um, you have Washington Irving to thank for that, because he made that up. Um, and, and so we see this kind of flexibility between, uh, you know, there's a, a blurred line between fact and fiction that, that we don't necessarily, um, we see those as being much clearer categories today. Washington Irving also wrote about Bannister Tarleton, and Tarleton becomes part of this story uh, again later. The Tarleton mythos is also really important to that early American uh, construction of identity, but I wanna save Tarleton for later because it's not until later that Tarleton gets associated with Francis Marion. Uh, and becomes part of that story. As we've heard today, their actual association in, in the historical factual path is very limited. Um, Tarleton chased after Marion for a very brief period of time and they never actually met in a battle. But later on, for reasons that, that have to do with this myth-making process, their stories get intertwined um, in important ways. The other example that I want to uh, point you to is a lesser known work, although some of you may be familiar with it, um, the novel Horseshoe Robinson by John Pendleton Kennedy, which uh, takes place, which is also from this period of early American literature. Uh, his hero, Horseshoe Robinson, is very much in that Fenimore Cooper mode, um, and he operates within the American Revolution in the South. So people are writing about this conflict not just about Marion, but about this conflict as being um, a site of those kinds of characters. By the way, Horseshoe Robinson actually dedicated to Washington Irving. Kennedy dedicated it to Irving. Uh, and, and this is just really interesting, I think. It was reviewed by Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote in the review, there were heroes of this mold in South Carolina who entered with the best spirit of chivalry into the national quarrel and brought, it, brought to it hearts as bold, minds as vigorous, and arms as strong as ever in any clime worked out a nation's redemption. These men refused submission to their conquerors and endured exile, chains, and prison rather than the yoke. So, you know, here's a great writer of American fiction who is, again, 
you know, celebrating this effort by American, uh, American fiction writers, as well as historians, to kind of celebrate this part of the American Revolution. Now, I grew up in the North. Um, I hate to even admit that here. But um, when I was in school, when I was in school, I don't know about y'all, but we barely listened, or we barely heard about the American Revolution in the South. Right? That's true. I, 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 have, I have picked up some things since I've been down here. Um, we, we barely learned about the Revolution in the South at all. Uh, and I'm sure many of you know that South Carolina has more Revolutionary War battles than any other state. Um, apologies to New Jersey, where I currently reside, um, which is second. But uh, that's not the way it's taught. But that wasn't always the case, because in these years immediately after the American Revolution, up till about the American Civil War, there was much more emphasis put on the South. And people like Marion were much more important to this story. After the Civil War, this changes, curiously. Um, and there's, <laughs> there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that um, Northerners intentionally kind of pushed the, the discourse about colonial America and the American Revolution back towards the North. So whereas before the Civil War, there was a lot of emphasis, especially on Virginia, but, but on the Carolinas as well, in terms of colonial America, and where was the seat of early American, uh, early American culture, there's a lot of emphasis on Virginia. After the, American, or after the American Civil War, Northern historians start emphasizing uh, the importance of Puritan New England. And places like Harvard and Yale, which are located in New England, start taking ownership of American colonial history. And there's this reorientation out of the Chesapeake and into um, New England. Um, just as, as an aside in that, uh, remember that it's Abraham Lincoln who makes Thanksgiving a national holiday. And that is, um, in addition to all the other things it is, it is part of that, that move of emphasizing Puritan New England over uh, the colonial South. But the other reason, the other reason that the South kind of recedes from the history of the American Revolution has more to do with you guys, and that is that Southerners, Southern historians after the Civil War, get obsessed with that war. And that's all they want to talk about, is the American Civil War. So we Northerners kind of forgot that the South was involved in the American Revolution, because we got interested in ourselves. And you Southerners kind of forgot that you were involved in the Revolution, because you got fascinated by this other more recent war. Um, and for all those reasons, People like Francis Marion, after the Civil War and until the middle of the 20th century, kind of recede from the story. Um, there are two really interesting exceptions to that. Uh, two almost forgotten silent films about Francis Marion. 1911's General Marion the, Swamp, the Swamp Fox and 1914's Francis Marion the Swamp Fox. Very similar names. Um, but for the most part, that story kind of recedes until Robert Bass and Walt Disney. Um, and this is where I want to take a minute to talk about the Disney show, which some of you may remember from the late 50s and early 60s, uh, and this resurrection of the Marian mythology. Um, this is part of a larger effort by Walt Disney to celebrate these mythological figures from the American past. So it's not just Francis Marion, there's also very similar shows on Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, um, even John Singleton Mosby, the Confederate Raider. All of these stories, they follow very similar formulas, and they all rely on that old 19th century idea of the American folk hero, who encapsulates all those values that, uh, that I talked about before. And so Marion gets pulled back to the forefront as part of that effort by Walt Disney to emphasize those 
those American values. It's important to remember that this is during the Cold War, uh, that this is once again a time when American values are perceived as being under attack, and those um, that American mythology and those American values are being brought to the forefront again. Because just like during our creation, those things become important to our to um, solidifying our idea of who we are, what we're fighting against, what we're all about. Um, and so there's this huge celebration, not just with Disney, although Disney's a huge part of it, there's this celebration of the frontier, of um, that style of American hero, and Francis Marion obviously becomes a really important part of that. In his intro to the very first um, to the very first episode of The Swamp Fox, Walt Disney explicitly calls him the American Robin Hood. Um, and so that's not just a coincidental similarity. That metaphor is pervading um, their articulation of, of this story. But he also relies on the frontier. Um, and in fact, the introduction to every episode of The Swamp Fox says, brought to you from Frontierland. Um, <laughs> Francis Marion is seen as being part of that. Even if he was fighting the British instead of the Indians, he wasn't literally on the frontier. He is seen as being part of the frontier. Um, and historian Richard Slotkin writes, uh, he actually wrote three works, uh, this massive trilogy on the importance of the idea of the frontier in American history, which I don't know if you're familiar with Frederick Jackson Turner, but Turner says that it's the idea of the frontier that makes America what it is. Um, and, and Slotkin kind of builds on this and talks about that the frontier is reinvented in every American generation as this place where the American identity and those American values are kind of distilled to their core. And Slotkin writes, um, it's in, uh, ideological underpinnings, meaning the frontier, are those same laws of capitalist competition, of supply and demand, of social Darwinism, survival of the fittest as a rationale for social order, and of manifest destiny that have been the building blocks of our dominant historiographical tradition and political ideology. So the frontier, not as a reality, but as an idea, is kind of like America on steroids. Right? <laughs> Everything that makes us us is even more so on the frontier. So Marion's association with that is also kind of putting him in that, in that metaphor. Um, again, he has this layer, this secret layer on Snow's Island, which seems an awful lot like, um, like Robin Hood's layer in, uh, in Sherwood Forest. He's always using some kind of trick, um, some of which <laughs> some of which Disney exaggerated from Bass's work of history, some of which, again, he just fabricated entirely, because it was more important to him, just like to Weems, to convey that idea of Marion as a role model than it was to tell a story that was factually accurate. Um, he's all, so again, he's always using some kind of trickery. He's always fighting against the odds. Uh, his enemies are always comically inept, which is, uh, a characteristic of all of the Disney shows. And there's this weird kind of willingness on, um, on Disney's part to take, to almost like reach into the historical grab bag and pull out things that are real and just start sprinkling, sprinkling them around at random. So um, I especially wanna bring up um, Marion's loyal second in command, uh, Sergeant Jasper. Yes, that Sergeant Jasper, um, who Christine just told us died in 1779. Uh, he, is, he is resurrected and put into Marion's brigade. Um, and Sergeant Jasper has this magical ability to convince anyone that he's a Tory simply by affecting a British accent. And he's able to use this in all kinds of ways to, to fool the British who never seem to catch on. Um, also, Marion's friend, Oscar, who is most definitely not his slave in, in the film. He's just, you know, his friend who happens to live with him and um, brings him his food and holds his horse and, and um, <laughs> makes up songs, including the theme song of the show. 
Um, and, and so, and so these, these are real people, right? These are real names from history, but Disney feels kind of free to take those things and repurpose them uh, how he wants. Instead of uh, Marion falling out a window or jumping out a window to avoid uh, a party, he jumps out of a window after having warned the garrison of Charleston that, that the British are approaching down the road. Um, unlike in reality where Henry Clinton took like six weeks from the time he landed on the ships to, to get to Charleston, um, in, in the show he takes them completely by surprise and Marion is the only one who knows and goes to warn uh, the American officers at this ball and, and nobody wants to listen to him and so he jumps out the window. So again, there's like echoes of the truth. There's echoes of the historical past, and yet they're doing completely bizarre things in the story. Um, and this is where Marion's association with Tarleton gets solidified, because Tarleton is the, the principal villain in this show. And um, I don't have time to talk about Tarleton, but Tarleton also goes through this really interesting transformation through this same period of American mythology being created and recreated uh, as this villainous figure in American history. And so, of course, Disney's got this hero. He needs a villain. Um, and so he just reaches into the bag and pulls one out. And so Tarleton, Tarleton becomes that principal villain in the story. Um, like every villain in every good story, Tarleton acts as a foil for Marion. So each of those characteristics that we went through of the American hero, um, Tarleton represents their exact opposite. And he serves to reflect those qualities back on Marion because he is in every way Marion's opposite. Um, not only is he evil and unprincipled, but um, he's not overly clever. He, um, he is respectful of authority rather than contemptuous of authority. Um, all of that. And I would also point out the importance of noble human beings. And here I would say all people, not just Americans. But moreover, their motivation for...